This is a recap of the meeting held in early April for the South Shore residents. Uh, we were, Sarah was invited to a community meeting and um, I have presented um, several key information on geotechnical matters to the residents. Um, we kicked off with actually looking at the damage to the land caused by the earthquake in September 2010, which um, South Shore already was extensively damaged from the September earthquake. If you then consider the damage to the Greater Christchurch area that was um, actually exhibited after the February earthquake, again, the large extent of damage was um, focused on um, South Shore, on the western extent um, to the actually uh, from Rocking Horse Road to the west. Why is um, South Shore still orange? We had significant damage in two earthquakes. Um, the area is um, geotechnically relatively complex. We have two geological domains. We have the sea on one side, to the east, and we have the estuary on the other side. Um, if you then consider um, what information have we collected since to assist actually in the zoning decisions, one of the key input parameters was actually LIDAR. And LIDAR is uh, measuring actually the vertical deformation of uh, the ground. Now that's where the first complexity arises. Um, Shaoshua is part of the area where the northern extent went down due to a tectonic uplift or, or downdraft and the um, southern area was actually dragged up with the port hills. So the fault line, if we would have um, uh, ruptured the surface in February, would have gone somewhere halfway through the South Shore area. So part actually went up, part of it went down. That combined with the fact that there is a ground densification as the ground is actually shaken, it densifies. So we have areas that went down, or we have areas that went up, but equally settled. So that's the first uh, one. The other part of land damage is actually uh, related to the lateral spreading. In the um, area of South Shore, we have some of the worst lateral spreading in Christchurch. A lateral spreading occurs when the ground is shaken and um, the block of unliquefied soil slides on um, the liquefied material and actually it causes large cracking, which generally is parallel to the edge of the estuary. So, Summarizing the damage in South Shore, we have um, lateral spreading, which is moderate to severe, and we have very thin crust because the land is relatively low-lying and the water table is very high. That's um, the one of the setting. So if we're looking at the lateral spreading, we can actually see that the most severe lateral spreading is to the west of Rocking Horse Road. Rocking Horse Road is actually the um, divider between two geological domains. On the eastern side, we have actually the sand dunes, and the sand dunes were bound, uh, actually compacted by the wave. So the wave action over the last couple of thousand years compacted the sand, as well as the uh, wind blowing over it actually packs the sand relatively dense. On the western side, we have the estuary depositing um, sands and silts uh, in a very slow moving current. So the sand is deposited very, very uh, loosely. So we have virtually the same sand on the eastern side, pounded by the waves in a dense packing. On the western side, very loose. All right. Now the one is susceptible to liquefaction is actually on the western side. So the eastern side, non-liquefiable. No lateral spreading on the western side, severe lateral spreading and um, essentially vertical settlement. And that is actually based on geotechnical investigation data, which is available on the EQC website as a geotechnical report. And it's numerous uh, corn penetrometer tests and a couple of pre existing boreholes that were considered in the area of South Shore and South New Brighton. Now, if you're looking at there are 401 properties that remain orange and in order to actually remediate the numerous options that can actually be considered there is no option that will fit all criteria and if i'm looking at what options are actually available from an engineering point first of all they divide in two categories one is to actually provide um, an underground wall and the wall will be about uh, 15 to 25 meters wide and up to 10 meters deep and the 
function of the wall is to prevent lateral spreading of the material on the eastern side of the wall. So if it shakes, the material liquefies, but is not able to actually move sideways. Another version of this one is actually a revetment structure, very similar to revetment structure on Radcliffe's area, where uh, we're creating a smaller wall, but actually it's preventing also to a certain extent the lateral spread. If you're looking at the engineering options to create these revetment structures and um, underground walls, we're looking at essentially at stone columns, which is one option um, to prevent the soil block from liquefying. The other option is vibro concrete columns or continuous flight augers. Other options considered more in Japan and the United States is put out providing earthquake drains, which should dissipate very rapidly the um, increased pore water pressures and that preventing the land from liquefying in the first place. But also we're looking at vibro flotation, which is densifying the, the soil around it. And probably lastly, we're looking at dynamic compaction. So we have a whole range of um, options that we can utilize and each one of them have advantages and disadvantages. And we consider obviously the impact from the construction activities and the timeliness of the construction activities. What do we mean by this one is very simply construction of um, several kilometers of stone columns is um, or can be very intrusive and actually has to be undertaken on a footprint much wider than the finished wall itself. So where these construction works can be undertaken, um, how they can be undertaken, how disruptive they will be and how timely they will be is a key consideration. And we don't um, have to do it just for one option, we have to do it for a number of options. Now, the third thing which comes into it then is the performance of the land after potential remediation have been completed. To what degree can the land actually be improved, so it's either TC2 and TC3 compliant, and how that will actually interact with the guidelines that were issued last Friday, and 27th of April, on the TC3 repair and remediation guidelines by the Department of Building and Housing. So this is also a key component that will feed into the um, zoning process on how buildings can actually be built, constructed um, over the next 50 years to actually be able to perform in repeat seismic events. And largely this um, work is based on the trial which was undertaken by EQC at uh, the QE2 park. Now some of this information has become available and the engineers are right now working on some of the feasibility options and costing and um, construction programming for the options I mentioned to have a look at remediation options.